Welcome to 100 Yards of Football. And this is our legend segment, and I'm your host, Bobby Butler. And tonight, we got a true legend with us tonight, Delray Beach Police Chief, Mr. Javaro Sales. Javaro, welcome to the show, man. Uh, thanks for having me, man. It's truly uh, an honor. Man, you know, we couldn't do this show without you. We eventually was going to get to you, right? <laughs> you, you know, it's, it's amazing, man. You know, the last few weeks I've been uh, finding so, many, so much information on um, the athletes in, um, in, in Palm Beach County and Delray and Boynton in particular. Right. And, um, and I think I shared with you when we, when we spoke on the phone Mm -hmm. that I found some stuff that um, that showed your dad at Carver yeah. High School way, way back in the day, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and so I'm excited. And so the, the most exciting thing about that, 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 that information was the fact that the, some of the men that are on that, uh, you know, that were all-stars and were great football players at Carver High School from Delray and Boynton, I never knew those guys play. I just thought they were Mr. So-and-so that lives in Delray, <laughs> Mr. So-and-so that lives in Boynton. And I was oh, saying, yeah. man, that guy was an all-conference. He was an all this, all that. So I'm excited. You know, it, make, it makes me feel like a kid in the, in the candy store again, man, when I, when I see that kind of stuff. Hey, man, just a different time. It was a different time. It was a different time. But it says a lot about where we come from, you know. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, people see you today, and all they see is he's the chief of police. Oh, yeah. But before you became the chief of police in Delray, you were a star athlete way back in the day. Yeah. You know, it's all, part, it's all part of the journey. It's all a part of the journey. Heading to your destination, man. That's right. Isn't all that part right? Of the that's right. And, and that's part of the stuff I want to talk about with you tonight, because people don't understand the things that you learn in sports, the discipline, oh, the yeah. training, all that stuff. If we know how to understand how to transfer it to something different, man, oh, yeah. it can make us highly successful in life. Oh, absolutely. I agree 100 percent. Absolutely. So let's let's talk about you, man. Um, Varo, you 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 started playing football at what age? Uh I started playing football. I started out playing flag football, actually, oh, with the uh really? recreation department here in Boston Beach. Okay. You know, and I went from flag football to uh we had a small fry, large fry league in Lake Worth. Okay. At the time. So I started out at a uh, small fry. And by the time I get the large fry, I was playing uh, junior high football. We had junior high schools back then. Wow. That's right. <laughs> junior, junior high school, I went to high school. But believe it or not, Bobby, mm -hmm. you know, the first position I played in uh -huh. small fry, junior high, all the mm -hmm. way up to uh, ninth grade was quarterback. Really? Oh, yeah. Wow. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, I played quarterback. <laughs> had, had a little decent little arm. The problem was, I, I didn't hold, I wasn't physically gifted on the height side of the right. spectrum, and um, we didn't have many rollout plays. We had all drop back plays. Oh. Right, and right, because right, of right. that, I had to uh, rethink my position. Right, right. Well, one of the things I can I, I know about you, man, you were always fast. So yeah. they, they could have put you anywhere in the skill position part, and you were going to be a great player. That's for sure. Yeah, you know, during that time, man, you had those uh, what you could consider the old school, basic fundamentals type coaches. That's so right. they really didn't utilize the speed in the manner in which they should have. Uh, That's right. <laughs> look, looking back at it, right. um, because if you look at my high school football team, we had about eight guys on the team running at least nine nine hundred yard dash. Oh, absolutely, man. At least absolutely. you know. And with that being said, and for mm -hmm. for two years, my junior senior year. We ran back zero kickoffs. No one kicked the ball what? to us for two years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. Had Steve had me in the middle, had Steve Miller on the right Miller, side of me. Right. He mm -hmm. had uh Glenn Robinson on the left side of me. That's crazy. All those guys was excellent athletes. And I know you remember Steve Miller. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, junior, yeah, junior college national uh, champion walked on the University of Football, uh, University of Florida and right. started. Wow. That's crazy, man. Yeah, oh, yeah. But, but we don't even kick off for, for two years. Wow. But, you know, we're, we're loaded down there. I mean, we're, oh, yeah, we're yeah. all. Yeah. yeah. The only the only hurtful part of that is we really never got a chance to show off what we're actually able to do. Right. Exactly. Especially from exactly. a speed standpoint because right. teams wouldn't take the chance. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I remember playing against you guys in high school when you were a sophomore, mm -hmm. right? 
And you had not only you and, 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 and Steve Miller, those guys, you had Kirby Jordan, you had Ronald Rats. Right? Oh, my goodness, yes. Like, oh, my gosh. Those you know? were some amazing athletes. Oh Unbelievable. Oh, gosh. And I can man. tell you, man, Kirby I, I had speed, but that Ron Raz and Tesla 42 that that kid ran with was second oh. to none. You know, Ron Raz was a special guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. You, you know, know. He, he, was a, he was a great football player. But, man, he was even a greater basketball player. <coughs> he was a great you know, athlete. I, yeah, he, he was a, just a great athlete, period. And then when I started talking about not not your, those guys who are a little older than you, a couple years older than you, you know, Tricky Rick, you know, oh, yeah. I, mean, I can go on and on and on and talk about <laughs> the great athletes that, that oh, played yeah. at Network High School. Matter of fact, I think Tricky Rick ended up uh, playing for the Falcons short for a brief period of time. Uh, yeah, I, th I think he tried out. With <laughs> yeah, I think he tried out for the Falcons at wide right. receiver. He did. And I think oh. Trick or Rick went to Morgan State, I believe. He did. But that guy was special. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I'll never forget the um, my junior year. And um, I played safety in high school. I never played corner until I got to college. And to be honest with you, you know, Mo Wesley was so good at it. I never mm -hmm. thought I was good enough to play out there, right? <laughs> you know, put, put me in the middle. Let me do my thing. But out yeah. there, no, no. Because Mo Wesley did it such, at such a high level in high school, I thought there's no way I can play that. But you but, know, it's, uh, all, it's I don't think people really realize how great an athlete Mo Wesley actually was. Man, you know, because guy. it wasn't like I say, it was a different time. I mean, we weren't uh, put out there in the manner in which we are now. I mean, right. we don't have we didn't have a social media uh, that, that available true. to us at that time. Because I can uh -huh. tell you, individuals just uh, yourself and people like mm -hmm. uh, Mo Wesley. It would have had social media at that point, man. The world would have known who you oh, were. The world, the world would know because world those know. those guys mm -hmm. were special. Oh yeah, and, and, and I and I tell you something, Barbara. We we were all small guys, right? Yeah. I, I know from a weight standpoint. Now I, I've been five eleven since Dave Gray, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And and I thought I was going to be about six three, six four, because you know all my uncles were that tall. You know, yes. uh, my uncle Bobby, my uncle Moody, Uncle Alvin. Those guys were pretty tall. And so being 5'11 in the eighth grade, I just knew, man, I don't, I'm going to be tall. I'm going to be tall. I've never grew not a half an inch more since that time. Yeah, it was all, hey, it was all, it was all part of the plan, though. But I can tell you, if you'd have been much taller, you'd probably have been in a different position. <laughs> right, exactly, right. And it may not have worked out. Right? Exactly. <laughs> it may not have worked out. Absolutely. But, but, but you know, um, especially when I look back, when I look back on the Delray Boynton, and Boca, mm -hmm. you know, Boca, you know, before integration, we all went to the one high, one high school. Mm -hmm. And for some of those guys who from 65, I think um, uh, Miss Lee went to um, Seacrest High School and I think 65 or 66. And uh, then Yvonne, Yvonne actually integrated Seacrest High School. She, she, she integrated Seacrest High School. She did. Right. And then because of the talent pool, you know, all those guys were going to Carver High School. Yeah. And so you think about that talent, and then you think about um, guys not being able to play. That's you know, right. They had to sit the bench, you know. Yeah, and so they probably went to other teams and started. It, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> and so you think about you, you think about guys like Rock Matthews, Doug Davis, you yeah. know. Um, um, there were so many guys from Delray and Boynton who went to Seacrest. Oh, yeah. That were football stars. Okay, so I grew up watching people like uh, Thomas Fan. Yeah, uh, Ernest Williams, Sylvester, uh, yes, Sylvester uh, uh, Watson. Uh, uh -huh. um, those guys were some amazing athletes. When I was a little boy, we used right. to go to the Seacrest football games, right. and I used to see these guys freaking up and down the field. I mean, exactly. when I was a little kid, I had to watch uh, running Mike run up and down the field and down up and down man. the track. Man, I thought he was the fastest guy I've ever seen in my life. That dude, Ronnie Mack, that dude was special. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, you know, I thought a, lot was, people, a lot of people don't understand. Ronnie Mack, well, well, how tall you say it was? Five eight at the most. Five, give or seven, take, five, give five, or five. take, give or take an uh, inch. Do you, do you know Varro? He had the high jump record at Atlantic High School for years until Tim Cornelius broke it. Oh yeah, Ronnie Mack high jump six eight in high school. Oh yeah, and he's about but five you, seven five eight. But you know, one of the best high jumpers ever in the history of, uh, well, at least in the United States, was was only five eight was Franklin Jacobs. That's, that's he had, true. He had jumped seven eight. That's true. That's crazy, man. He was five eight. That don't even make sense, man. Don't make sense. 
Hey, hey defies the laws of gravity. Hey, now you know, you know that's God given when that happens. Oh yeah, right? that defies the laws of gravity, man. That's, that's God given right there. That, 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 that's that's right. incredible, man. Yes, right. Let's get, let's get back to you, man. You know, we mm -hmm. we got a strong tradition from where we come from, but when you left, um, oh, let, I got to share this story. This is one of the most important stories in my life, right? And so, um, my senior year. I'm running track. It's my first track meet of the year. And we run at the Boca Invitational. And, you know, I knew Varro. I knew he was fast, right? And so I'm running the third leg of what we call the 880-yard relay, <laughs> which now would be called the what? The 4 by 2 4 by 2 It would be called a 4 by 2 now. And so I'm running. Now, the, two, the 220 was my race, man. I'm just telling y'all, that was my race. You know, I ran the 100, but that wasn't it. It was the 220. So Larry Coffey, give me a lead. And I'm running. I'm, I'm comfortable. I'm out there profiling, right, styling. <laughs> Next thing you know, I heard, I heard them clicks going, ta 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 And I tried to get it, and I couldn't get it. And he comes dropping the ball <laughs> past me, right? Man, I was so embarrassed. I'll never forget that, man. I was embarrassed. Look at here. We had to get you back because we could never beat you in football, so we had to beat you in football. <laughs> But, but but you know what's funny, man? You know what's funny? You know what that made you know, you know what that made me do? Mm -hmm. and, you know, every moment, every moment, if we can if we can just understand that the moments that we think are really bad, oh yeah, if we'll learn from them, learn. oh yeah, absolutely. Listen and go on. Because here's what mm -hmm. happened, man. After that, I was embarrassed. I went to track practice every day, man, mm -hmm. and I was working hard. But what I did, Varro, I went home at night and I worked extra. Oh, yeah. I got myself in condition because I had just left basketball, right? Oh, yeah. I got myself in shape. And about a month and a half later, I broke the school records in the 100-yard dash and the 220. And 220. But you know what? The diff and that's the difference I see. We didn't have the technology that a lot of these kids have today and all the, mm -hmm. these technical uh, aspects of, right. of the sport like mm -hmm. a lot of these kids have available to them today. We were hard workers, man. I hard worked. Work. Out, I hard worked work. out year. I was. A, I was. A, I worked out year round. Absolutely. During the summers. Absolutely. We worked out. Matter of mm -hmm. fact, that was part of my everyday life. Is to was to work out, to stay to in work shape. Out. I never wanted to be out of shape. Right. Exactly. Well, one thing I can say about you, um, what I know about you personally, is that you are a hard worker, right? And so I was so impressed with you because I know. Um, well, your your junior year, you ran the nine four hundred yard dash. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what you ran the two twenty in your junior year. You, you remember twenty one flat, twenty one flat. So yeah. you, you were about to bust tw twenty point at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, did you did you run the hundred any faster your senior year? You ran the two twenty any faster your senior year? Uh, I ended up running the hundred in my senior year at nine three. Okay, you you got a nine three. Okay, mm -hmm. good. What, what about the two twenty? Twenty point eight. Twenty point eight. Man, yeah. And see, those are great times. But you know what impressed me, man? You know, um, when I left, I left a, a year ahead of you. So I don't know what you did your senior year in high school. Right. But you, you guys fast forward a few years later, and I'm running track at Florida State my junior and senior year. And you're running um, mm -hmm. at FAM. And we're running right. in some of the same meets. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the next thing you know, I see you running a quarter. Yeah. Now, now I'm gonna tell you something. That's a man's race right there, bro. You ain't gotta tell me about it, bro. That, bro, everybody can't run that race right there. I don't, I don't care. Put it this way: I don't know too many people grow up saying, "I want to be a quarter mile." Not, neither do I. But I can tell you, my pride, <laughs> my, my, my pride got me in trouble with that one, Bobby. <laughs> we had a time trial in practice one day. Okay. And the coach used me as a rabbit. He put me out like five meters. Okay. <laughs> on the 400 guys. We had four. We had four guys running in the forty fives. Wow, man! He set me out five meters and told them to catch me. Wow! I took offense to that, man. <laughs> I said, "Catch who? Catch who? <laughs> catch who? You gonna give me five meters and they gonna catch who? Right? Look at here. Never That's ran a quarter in my life, but I knew <laughs> my pride was not gonna let me down. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I ain't up beating them by. I ain't up beating them by ten meters. Wow, wow. Well, boy, that, I don't know that, if that was that, a blessing or a curse. Well, that, that was not only uh, your pride, it was your heart. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, because you got to have heart if you run that race, man. Oh, it's no joke, man. It's you no have joke. Heart. You know, I, I, had, up, 
I ended up getting down to in the open. I did uh, like 45-1, 45-2 in the yeah. open. And that's crazy. My, uh, I, I ended up doing some 44 Ooh. splits in the mile Ooh. relay. That's crazy, man. That's crazy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, oh, you yeah. Know, and, I, and I used to see you running in college. I go, man, <laughs> but he's such a great 100-meter 200 guy. You yeah. know? But but that, that quarter, man, is a special race. And so right. I, had the, I had the privilege of running um, um, in college with a guy named Walter McCoy. Who oh, yeah. was unbelievable running the quarter? I ran against Walter McCord numerous of times. As a matter of fact, the first time I ran in Walter McCord was in the uh, regionals in high school. Wow. Okay. <laughs> he was a junior. He was a junior. I was right. a junior. He was a senior. Right, right, right. That's right. That's right. I beat him in the preliminaries and he beat right. me in the final. Wow. Man. Hey, that's yeah. up, man. Oh, well, yeah. Now, you're talking about a guy who had heart. That Walter guy McCoy had- was a was a absolute beast. He was a big he had more sub forty six quarters than any athlete in the history at that time. Wow, that's crazy. At Florida State. State. At Florida State. At Florida State. That's right. At Florida that's State. Right. Most sub forty six four hundreds. That's right. And, um, we don't talk about Walter McCoy, and we talk about great athletes when it comes to track and field. That's but I true. can tell you, him and uh, Mike Robeson, Mike Robeson, an absolute beast, uh, hey, coming up through the state of Florida. I, I think it. Walter came from uh, Daytona Sea Breeze, and I think right, Walter McCoy came from Winter Park. Went apart. That's right. You got it right. right. You got it right. Now I ran with both those guys in college. I gotta tell you something. I would have never thought I would run be running track in college. I'm just gonna be honest with you, right? And so how I got on the track team, Varo, it it was it was strange. So you know, typically in spring football, when spring football is over, the football team players don't have anything to do for about a month. And so me and my roommate after spring football, my, my sophomore year at Florida State, we went to Tully Gym. Cause everybody hung out and played basketball at the gym. Okay. So we go to the gym. Nobody's in the gym. We're like, man, where is everybody today, man? So we walk back outside and we saw all these people at the track. So we walked across the street to the track and it was intramural track. <laughs> and so I go out there and I, I told my roommate, going. I said, man, I'm going to get here in long jump. I went, I went in no position to run. Because I had been I had been drinking to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> so I told my roommate, I said, man, I'm gonna get out here long jump. And I ran down that track, man, and jumped almost 24 feet. And the track coach was standing right, Coach Roberts was standing right by the pit. Coach Roberts. Oh, and yeah. he said, Bobby, we need you on the track team. <laughs> and I said, Well, if you talk to Coach Bowden, you know, and so I was a guinea pig. I was, you right. know, before Leon and those guys, you know, were just released to go run track. Right. I was playing football. So I had to do all my spring football activity before mm-hmm. I could go to track practice or go to a track meet. And so wow. I was kidding. They were killing me, man. Wow. They were killing me. It's funny because my college career was like in the opposite of yours. Right. I went there on track scholarship and I wanted mm-hmm. to play football, right. but my track coach wouldn't let me play football. Right. He said, he, I mean, he just said, no way. No and way. my junior year, he finally let me go out for the team. Wow. wow. <clears throat> I ended up setting, breaking the kickoff return record. Wow. And made all conference with, for kick return, especially wow. the teams. That's and the crazy. following year, I had a, I split my quadricep muscle in half in my career. That my yeah, right, right, over, right, 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 right. So, but it, my, but it was just in the opposite of what yours took place. I wow. went down for track and field. The coach finally let me go out for football, and I ended up doing fairly well. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance <laughs> to play that second year. Right, right, exactly. And and that, and that would have been the year, man. And that would have been the year. That, that would have been, been the year. That, 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 that first year got me acclimated, you know, right. especially being able to uh, participate on the specialty teams and right. uh-huh. excelling on the specialty teams. Right. I expected my senior year to be uh, truly a breakout uh, year for me. Right, right. exactly. Yeah, look here. I had to sw- had to swallow the lip, the, you know, the, the lemons and that type thing. <laughs> right. Yeah, I had to swallow that. You know, it just didn't work out for me. Exactly. Well, you, well, you know, it, it, it's amazing because I, I know um, during our time in college, you know, um, there was a big event, uh, mm-hmm. uh, a world ride event that took place, and I know that you wanted to participate in that in 1980, yes. called the, the the Olympics. And um, I know you were invited to the Olympic trials. Yes. But we boycotted the Olympics in 1980. So tell me from a guy who was a track guy, what that did to people during that time. 
Well, I could tell you it, it was devastating to athletes such as myself and many others because mm -hmm. we worked so hard to give ourselves the, the best opportunity possible mm -hmm. to participate, to make it to the Olympic trials. Mm -hmm. But because of the, the animosity with Russia and the United States and other countries, the United States decided we weren't, uh, we weren't going to participate that year. Mm -hmm. With that being said, they had a watered down version of the Olympic trials. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, unfortunately, my sponsors wasn't willing to send me anymore because right. of the fact that it wasn't going anywhere. Right. Exactly. It was a disappointment, but disappointment, mm -hmm. but I understood. Right. And right. I had qualified to participate in the 200 meters. Right. Wow. At the time, yeah. I had ran um, like a 20.1. Right. 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 You'd have been right meters. in there. Yeah. And I think the qualifying, I think you needed about a 20.3 to even qualify. Like to even, right. Uh, exactly. in, uh, uh, maybe a little, uh, maybe 24, 20.4, like something that. along those lines. Right. But I right. qualified as far as time wise. So I'm looking forward to it. You train, uh -huh. you train, you train. I mean, any track athlete um, of That's any it. merit, that is the pinnacle of track and field is Absolutely. to make it to give yourself a, the chance to make it to the Olympics. You know, the Olympic, and the Olympic trials is just the segue into making that happen. So Absolutely. when that when that when that happened, man, I was it was it took a lot out of a lot of people. Not only me, but mm -hmm. it took a lot out of a lot of people because it did. Think about it, it did. That was a lot of people' last opportunity to go. Last opportunity, exactly right. That last opportunity to go, last you know, and right. unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, you know, I qualified again in in uh, uh 84. 84. Okay, and two weeks before the trials, I pulled my hamstring running the 200 at Florida State. Really, wow, yeah, wow. at Florida State, and it was a wow. pretty uh severe strain. Okay. So, wow. that, that let me tell you something, man, sports did a lot for me. I got a chance to see over 40, uh, 40 states mm -hmm. and a few different countries. Mm -hmm. But I could tell you, it, boy, it takes a lot out of you, too. Well, well, well people, you, you know, it's amazing. People who don't know anything about it, DeVarro, you know, you know what they think? Those guys are just playing, right? You know, oh, just like uh, you go outside and play. People don't know <laughs> the dedication, the hard work it takes to be a supreme athlete, especially if you're on the level that we were. You know, Absolutely. you're an Olympic guy and the NFL guy. You know, it takes a lot of dedication. Right. And if, you're, and, and if you don't well, have you know, passion, we went to college. Everybody good. Everybody's Everybody good. good Everybody's good. Everybody's exactly. good. Everybody's good. So that's right. So you got to outwork me. You got to outwork go. me. I'm going to give myself the, the best chance I possibly can to succeed. Right. That's the X factor. That's, that's the X factor. factor. So I tell you, everybody I tell good. You, I tell these kids today, man, y'all don't understand. You know, you know, when you're asleep, somebody's working. Somebody's Absolutely. working while you're asleep. They were asleep. So so you see these kids know. now. I work with a few kids, you know. You, I don't think I want to work out today. I think I'm gonna take the week off. Okay. If that's what you want to do, so be it. But I could tell you, your competitor, they working. They working. They They're working. working. They're working. Because I say I tell kids before you go to camp, the best. To give yourself the best chance possible, you go mm -hmm. there in shape. Be in shape. There you go. Be in buddy. shape. There you go. That's going to give you the best opportunity the best to opportunity. make the team. Absolutely. Be in Absolutely. shape before you get there. Don't be use the to get in shape. That's true. And, That's true. and a, lot of, a lot of them do that, and they and they don't make it. They don't they make it. They can't get through the workouts. Right. And then, and then you know, if you're not in shape, you're, you're subject to injuries, more injuries Absolutely. than you're not in shape. Absolutely. And so they don't get that. I'm like, dude, your body, you gotta, if, if you if you're doing something physical, right, your body has got to be prepared. Right. To not only tell you, short, but until to they make, feel to realize mm -hmm. they don't understand when you're training by yourself, that's at one level. But that's when you're training level. against when you're competing against others, you got to better rise to another level. To another level. If your body is not physically prepared to get you there, if you're not mentally prepared to get there, guess what? There's gonna be a breakdown somewhere. You're in trouble. You're in trouble. You're in trouble. You're in, you're in trouble. You could go out there with hundreds all day by yourself. You, you can't do it. But you line people up beside you. <laughs> that's a different story. Bro, that's, that's a whole, different other, story. That's a whole hey, other level. Hey, Javar, I got I got to tell you this. At Florida State, right? So mm -hmm. I'm practicing with Walter McCoy. And what they would do with me, and you know yeah. I'm not a I'm not a quarter mile. Right. So <laughs> when I come from football, they will put me, I'll be in um um, some of the indoor meets in the four by four. Mm -hmm. All right, man, you know, I'm not in no shape to do this. 
you know, I just left the football field five days ago. <laughs> and, and they'll stick me in the four by four, man. I'd be embarrassed. I was on TV one time. We had just, listen at this, man. Mm -hmm. We had just lost the Orange Bowl my senior year to Oklahoma mm -hmm. by one point, right? Mm -hmm. Had we won the game, we could have claimed the national championship at Florida State, right? So it was my last college game, and I'm depressed, man. So I go back to school, and I, I don't go to track practice. I'm just sitting in my room sucking, man. I'm just sucking, man. It's all over, man. Ain't nothing I can do no more about this football thing, right? Yeah. So, so all of a sudden, I'm, I'm sitting in my wife's apartment, who's my fiance at the time, uh -huh. and there was, a, there was a, a, a knock at the door. Bam, 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 bam. She opened the door. It was Coach Roberts. He walked in the apartment. He said, man, where you been? We, we need you this weekend to go. I said, Coach, <laughs> Coach I can't go nowhere this weekend. I'm, I have a ran since the game. You know, he said, we need you to run the four by four. I said, Coach, I can't do that, man. I can't do that. I said, oh, no, I can't do that. I'll run the 60 <laughs> and long jump. So I had to go because, you know, uh, Walter McCoy was calling me. I said, well, I got to go. These are my teammates. Uh -huh. And I went. And I'm running the four by four, man. I run the third leg. We're in, we're in um, uh, Middle Tennessee, and I'll never forget it, man. I, I got the lead. I had Ron Nelson gave me the stick. I had the lead, and I'm running. I'm out there just trying to make sure I don't give out a breath. I'm going, going, going. And next thing you know, man, in that last curve, Oklahoma came by me and passed me, and I want to throw that stick and hit that guy in the back of the head, right? We had just lost to Oklahoma in the Orange Bowl. <laughs> so, so I'll never forget that, man. But they would do that to me every preseason to get to catch me up with everybody. Uh -huh. And then when outdoor came, you know, I run the hundred and the two hundred mm -hmm. and, and run the relays, and that that was pretty much it. But um, um, but what they would do to me in practice, I run with Walter McCoy, Ron Nelson. Uh -huh. James Booty, that whole group run the quarter. That's, that's a heck of a crew. That's a heck of a training crew right there, man. Palmer Simmons. I, I mean, all oh, yeah, of them. Right? Simmons. But yeah, you had, the, you, had, you had the twins over there. And we had the twins. That's right. Exactly. <coughs> twins. Keith and, Kevin, Keith and Kevin Johnson. I'm going to tell you, man. I'm going to tell you a story similar to that uh -huh. one you just told. Oh, I got sick of running the 400. <laughs> I felt as though that you taking away, I'm not running 100 meters anymore. Right. Exactly. So I call myself rebelling by quitting. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. No, you didn't, bro. I quit the team. I didn't tell the coach that. I told other players, the, the runners, that I quit. I stopped going to practice. I hadn't gone to practice in probably like 10 days, but I was going out to the golf course running every day. And running downhills. Right. Okay. Get, get, okay. All right. Dude, get ready four o'clock one morning. Four o'clock uh -huh. one morning. At a boom, boom, boom on my door. On my door. <laughs> Open the door. It was Coach Bobby Lane. <laughs> Bobby Lane. Bobby Lane told me if I don't have, I better pack a bag. I better have my short red A on the bus in the next forty-five minutes. <laughs> oh, that's right, boy. I know that's right. Hey, and Bobby Lane wasn't playing either. He didn't play. Dude, Bobby I Lane packed my play. bags and I hit that bus. I'm gonna tell you what I, I'm gonna tell you, man. To this very day, uh-huh. I ran the 60. The, I was in, we was in the MEAC at the time. Okay. In 1981, I ran a 6-3 in the 60-yard dash. Wow. And to this very day, that record still stands. It still stands. That's man, that's Since strong. 1981. Like that. And guess what? They don't run yards anymore, so I guess it'll last forever. <laughs> it lasts forever. That's what I'm talking about, man. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I love it, man. So your, your name will always be the record. Of <clears throat> In that same meet, wow. that was the, it was the conference meet. Okay. I set the 60 yard dash record in wow. 1981, and it still stands to this very day. Wow, man. That's amazing, man. That's amazing. Unbelievable. See, unbelievable. see it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable, man. And, and so when, when we talk about that kind of speed, and let me ask you a question, man. Um, you talked earlier about that we didn't have we don't have the technology that they have today. The things that mm -hmm. kids got to get faster today, we didn't even have the science for how to eat the right way. Oh no! But we, we, we did have one thing: a work ethic. Oh yeah. Now let me ask you this question because I I, I got a hold of this my senior year. Matter of fact, right after you ran by me in that in that relay, 
Uh, one of my boys, Van Williams. I don't know if you mm-hmm. remember Preston Williams. Played, oh, played yeah, absolutely. I'm a ran man. Track, I'm ran, yeah, ran track at mm-hmm. Boca and played football at Boca. Right. We've been, we've been buddies since, you know, we played rock ball when we were like right. in fifth, fifth grade. And so he called me. He said, look, man. Well, he had, he was running like a 9-9. And then he went down to like a 9-7. I said, dude, what you doing? I said, man, what you doing? He said, meet me at the beach tonight. Uh-huh. And so we started working out doing sprint work at the beach. That was part of what I was doing after you ran me down, right? <laughs> I was getting that beach sand at but what night. you didn't know, I had already been doing it. You had already been doing it, see? And so me and Van was meeting up there, and, and all of that work, it, it, it took me where I could break the school record. Oh, yeah. And, and, oh, yeah. and then when I went to college, you know, from a football standpoint, man, it just made me explosive, right? You know, no. I, I had no idea I had what I had in me when I went to Florida State as a true freshman playing mm-hmm. football until I got there, right? Well, see, I'm going to tell, tell you what helps, Bob, because when you, when, you went there, not only a uh, sound mind, but you, you was physically ready, to, ready too. I was you ready. know what I mean? We know really we have ready. to elevate once we get right. to at each and every mm-hmm. level. We have to elevate. Mm-hmm. But at mm-hmm. the end of the day, if you're not mentally and physically prepared mm-hmm. to do that, mm-hmm. what, you, what you accomplish doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And, and, and you know, it's amazing that you say that because mentally, man, when I tell you I was ready, my, my mama says this to me all the time. And, and and I say, mama, I really didn't do that. Don't tell me I did that because y'all, she always makes me feel bad. She said, when I took you to Florida State, she said, when I took you to the complex, she said, I remember you getting out of the car, we opened the trunk, you got your suitcase, she said, and you didn't look back. She said, you didn't even say bye. I said, Mom, I ain't do that. I said, Mom, I know I ain't, I ain't do it. She said, son, you didn't even say bye. And this was my only comeback, Varro. Mom, I was ready. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I was thinking about it. You was focused. You was, you was, I was focused. Ready. I was ready. It wasn't, it was wasn't no question about that. It wasn't no question. And, and, look here. and for, your mom, for your mom to see that and understand that, right? that means exactly. a lot. It means a lot, right? Exactly. <laughs> it means a lot. I, I, yeah, absolutely. I was, ready, I was ready for that next level because one of the things in me, I don't know if you ever heard my whole story, but man, I was dreaming to play in the NFL since I was nine years old. Oh, and yeah. so I, I used to visualize the next steps my whole right. life. And so yeah. when it came, I was, man, I'm telling you, I was ready. When I went to training camp as a true freshman, and you know, I was lighting the draw, I only weighed 145 pounds. But that made but that made you even more competitive though. Make more competitive. Make more competitive. more competitive because all my life I was told that I was too small, I was too it's short too to small. be fast. I'm too exactly. small. I'm too small. I got exactly. so sick of hearing that. It, hearing those that, those people, everybody believed that but me. Now, now you done said something. So what you're saying that your thoughts are everything. And That's the right. only thing you can control are your thoughts. That's it. Not what somebody else think about you, but what mm-hmm. you think about. You. Right. Right. I'm, I'm going to tell, tell you another piece of that, though, Bobby. Mm-hmm. You got to mm-hmm. look at our foundations, too, man. Oh, oh, no question about look that. Look at our foundations, man. Our parents, right. man. We're, we're I can tell you something. That's right. That, that's, right. That, that, that's, hey, that's where it all started at. That, that's where it started. That's where it started. My, my, my mom and my father, mm-hmm. and I'm sure yours as well, mm-hmm. Told me constantly, continuously that I can accomplish anything I set my mind on accomplishing. Now you said a mouthful right there. Now when we, we when we talk about support in business, we talk about having a mastermind alliance. Oh yeah, right. Oh yeah, and that's people in your corner helping you to go to your destination, your vision, your dreams, your goals in life. Right. Oh yeah. And my mama, Varro. <laughs> mm-hmm. I tell people this all the time. My mama, I can't even remember the last time. I'm 62 years old. Just turned 62 last month. I can't remember the last time my mama called me by my name. She always called me champ. Oh, yeah. Ever since I was a little kid. Champ. Mm-hmm. Champ. I was always her champion, right? When I played for the Derry Rocks, I can always hear her screaming in the stands. I never heard her say a negative thing about anything. My father, I never heard them criticize never. a coach. I never heard them because see, when, when 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 the kids hear the parents say the wrong things in the house, you know, they can't even go play for a coach because no. the parents don't 
done, done, done said so many bad things about the coach. The kids see the coach as a bad thing. Absolutely. So but when you he tries to, you, you can't teach a kid under those circumstances. You can't teach a kid under those circumstances. You can't teach and a kid. So they're, not willing, they're not going to be willing to learn from a coach when they don't receive the proper teaching from home. Exactly. So you, it starts at the home. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's at home, and, and we were blessed, man, and fortunate to have oh, you know, good parents. Man, my mom, parents. I didn't, I didn't get a break. I went from sport to sport to sport. I played volleyball, kickball, dodgeball. You, you, whatever. Everything. If it had a ball to it, you played. I played it. Absolutely, and it Absolutely. wasn't here, and it wasn't an option. Thank you, thank you. I was, hey, I was going to be proud of you. Exactly, exactly. Well, well, listen, man, let, let's talk about your dad, man. You mm. know, um, Mr. Alex Sim. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, he, he's a special man. You know, everybody wants to know him. He, he he owned his own barbershop for years. Um, he even cut my hair sometimes, man. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and um, we we know that he was very gifted athlete as well. Oh, yeah. Talk, talk, talk about him. Talk about him for me. Yeah, man. Let me tell you something. I'll tell you, I was working this detail. I was an officer at the time. I'm, I'm working a detail at Publix. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Pompey walks up to me. Oh, wow. And uh, Yeah, Mr. Pompey. Lived, I had no idea who Mr. Pompey was. I had never <laughs> met him. But apparently, he knew who I was. He walked right. up to me. He said, how you doing, Mr. Sims? Uh -huh. I'm, 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 I'm Spencer Pompey. Wow. wow. And I knew exactly who he was because my right. father always spoke about him. Always talk about him, right. Exactly. Oh, yeah, my father always spoke about him. Um, mm -hmm. So he went from that, and he dug right in. He said, I heard, I, I, I've heard how fast you, you were, but I can tell you, your father was faster. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it, man. I love it. So I politely, you know, I went into my competitive mindset. Right, right. I said, with all due respect, Mr. Pompey, I will smoke my dad. <laughs> but he told me out of his mouth, he told right. me my father had the most raw speed that he had ever coached. He you know, he was coached right? a lot of people. Right. You know, he coached a lot of people. Now, what's right. so ironic about that, when I found that, my dad was 140 pounds and played offensive guard. Offensive guard, right? <laughs> and if, one of the, if not the fastest on the team, playing right. offensive guard exactly. at 140 pounds, that let like, you uh, know what type of athletes they must have had back in those times. See, and see, that's my point. Everybody was athletic. And so you think about it, your dad played what, on the offensive line? Offensive line at 140. At 140. I'm going to tell you something. I'm gonna tell you something that's crazy as well. The first athlete from Boynton Delray, mm -hmm. Boca, to make it in the NFL mm -hmm. was a guy by the name of Jim Cannonball Butler. Mm -hmm. All right, lived in Boynton, right? I'm, yeah, I'm acquainted to him. I'm acquainted All with right. him. All right. Oh yeah. Cannonball, listen to this now, was mm -hmm. a star NFL All Pro running back. Mm -hmm. Now, now watch this now. He never played running back at Carver. <laughs> could, could get on the field as a running he back. He could get on the field. And listen to this. He played tight end. Yeah. And went on and played um, college ball at Edwards Waters College in Gosh. Jacksonville, Florida. Yes. This, watch this now. To this day, now, Cannonball was in college in the early 60s. Right. All right, late 50s, early 60s. Played tight end in high school, couldn't even get in the backfield. He go to Edwards Waters, and he's this great running back, becomes this great tailback. To this day, this is what, 2021? Yes. He's the only player out of Edwards Waters College to ever be drafted in the National Football League. What, what, what is that saying? That is amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Now, granted, you talking uh -huh. about when he was in high school, you had kids as far back as north as Lake Worth High School and as far south as Deal Field Beach. At Deal Field Beach. High School. That's right. Going Think about one that. high school. One high school. So you could, imagine, you could imagine the number of athletes that came out of that vast area. That was unbelievable. That's unbelievable. <laughs> they had kids going away to the military, coming back to high school, playing football. And playing football because they couldn't play when they were in high school. <laughs> when my father told me that, I thought he was just pulling my leg until no, no, no. I heard it from other people. No. I said, well, how is that possible? Right. 
They did that it. Kids playing against grown men. Grown men, right? Grown men. <laughs> hey man, oh. it happened. The talent pool was off the chain. Oh yeah. And here's the amazing thing. And so part of this show, I want I hope kids listen to our show. Because I want them to understand, listen, Delray and Boynton just didn't get good in the last 20 years. Oh, no. Or the last 10 years. It's oh, yeah. been like this oh, yeah. since we put on a football uniform. Oh, yeah. It's been like this. You know, and you one know, thing I, I, I tell the kids, too, I mean, we, I mean, I think history is very important. Uh, yes, is. National world history is very important. Yes. Learn the history in your, in your hometown. In your own town. Learn the, your history in your own hometown. Absolutely. You'll be amazing. Of some Absolutely. of the things that people have accomplished from your hometown. It, that's amazing, man. It's, it's, it, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, so some people have done some amazing things right here from Dale Ray and Bolton. Right and, uh, and Bolton. Absolutely. Amazing. And then we see them walk around town. We don't know who they are. We don't have a clue. You know, when, when I went through that information that I got, I'm looking at names. I'm going like, man, that's Mr. So-and-so. I had no idea. <laughs> Bro, I had no idea. Yeah, I'm telling you, I have no These, idea. There was so so many amazing athletes and people oh from this area. It's unbelievable. It's and, unbelievable. You know, unfortunately, they just didn't have the same opportunities as a lot of not even us when we came through. They right, didn't right, have the same right. opportunities we had right, uh, when exactly. we came up through the system. And the kids that they have even more opportunities to take if they want to take advantage of them. Take, if they want to take advantage of them. But kids right. get caught up. One thing I Kids get caught up. I want to go to D1. I want to go to D1. I want to go to D1. I said, let me tell you something, young man. You get in where you fit in, number in one. Because Absolutely. if you're good enough, you'll be seen. There you go. If you're good there enough, you'll be seen. Even if you got to walk on as a free agent somewhere. Free agent, right. If you're good yeah, enough, you'll be seen. Yeah, especially today. You know, especially. especially well, you know, it's, a, it's amazing right now. I got I to gotta, I gotta say this, you know, um, when I tell people how much I weigh, they tell people say to me quickly, "Well, you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't be in Division One today," which could be true because I was 145 pounds. Mm -hmm. But Coach Bouton didn't know I wasn't 145 pounds. He thought I was 170. And so, <laughs> so Mauro, So when I go on the recruiting trip to Florida State, I don't know if you know Steve Harden. Steve Harden uh, was a quarterback coach at Atlantic uh, up until my junior year. He yes, played at yes, I remember him. He played at Seacrest High School. Mm -hmm. uh, when I played at Atlantic, he was a quarterback coach. And then he left my senior year and went to uh, Florida State. And so he was part of the team that came to recruit me. And so when, when I went to, to meet Coach Bowden in Tallahassee, he told me before I went to the office, he said, Bobby, I want you to wear your letterman, your high school jacket. He said, and don't take it off when you get in the room. <laughs> I'm to figure out why I can't take my jacket off. You know, so so I always been a kid. I listened to what my what what, what my <laughs> what the adults told me, and I did exactly what they told me to do. So I went in the room, Coach Bowden, and he just talking, man. He talking, you know, Coach Bowden can talk, right? Oh yeah. So next thing you know, I'm sweat. I got on this jacket, and I kept saying, Coach Harden said, "Don't take the jacket off." So don't take it off. I'm telling myself, I'm talking to myself, "Don't take this jacket off." Whatever you do, well, I didn't take it off, and so I fast forward. I signed, of course. I went there. And during training camp, you know, in practice, you have to weigh in. Mm -hmm. So I was weighing in at 145 before I went to practice. So you can imagine in Tallahassee, how does it in Tallahassee? Oh, well, yeah. I was weighing out after practice. I was like 135, right? right? <laughs> and so I didn't notice at the time, but he was going off on the coaches. Y'all got this kid up here. He's a liability. He's too small. You know, we're going to get sued up here. This kid shouldn't be here. And then that first week, something magic happened. I knocked the tight end out in practice. Knocked him unconscious, right? And that's the last time they had that conversation. <laughs> yeah, conversation. Look at here. Sometimes you have to prove yourself. You have to prove yourself. But you have to be ready to do that, too. You have to be ready, but you have to be given the opportunity. You have to be given an opportunity. And, and, and so the thing is, kids, you always have to be ready for the opportunity. Yes. Yes, and it goes you, too, you know, you, know, you, know, you, you got to be ready for it when it comes. Yeah, and that's just one part of it too, because a lot of times, a lot of conversations I have with the kids now that wants to go uh, excel on to uh, uh, college. Right. I say, look here, man, you got to get your grades. Got to get them grades. You got to focus on your grades. You know, and and there was a there was a coach from Duke that said some coach mm -hmm. uh, Derek Jones from Duke. Mm -hmm. He said something. He said, "Good athletes 
with bad grades become hometown legends that never get out of their hometown. Wow. Bro. And that's a fraternity, and that's a fraternity you never want to be a part of. It kids need to understand. I don't care how great an athlete you are. Mm. That's another aspect to getting to that next level. Too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because well, if you can't read and understand the playbook, guess what? Right. You don't get well, on the field. You have to get on the field. You're not going to get on the field. And, and I'm going to tell you, I, I've, I, now I've witnessed that time and time again in training camp because I, I, I went to 12 training camps in the NFL, right? Oh, yeah. And I, I every summer there were kids who wouldn't make it, not because of athletic ability, but because they didn't understand the plays. And I'm going to tell you something. And that playbook going to change every game. Every game. There's going to be a little twist to it. There's going to be a little twist to it. <laughs> so you got to remember You got to remember what you did in week one. We, we won, right. And, exactly. Yeah. And you hey. might be in week six now, but it might revert back to something in week one. Varro, our, our defensive playbook was about, I hope, how do I get it? It was about that thick. It was about that thick, right? Unbelievable. Right? And so you're talking about pages. And so that was the base information you had to know. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And then during the season, you remember when I was playing in the 80s, the 49ers were, were the team, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. we, we were in the same division with them, the mm -hmm. NFC West, right? The Falcons right. and the Saints, we played the NFC West against the Rams and the 49ers. Mm -hmm. Well, the 49ers was the, was the dog in the hunt in the 80s. Oh, yeah. And what they did from an offensive perspective, they ran 100 different formations. Oh, yeah. Now you figure out how can you do a hundred different formations? Crisscrossing here, running backs going this and that way. I mean, I'm right. and so what they would do, they would put it on film so that it would confuse defensive coordinators and how to defend what they were doing, right? And so it was amazing. So you had to be smart and intelligent. Oh, yeah. In the NFL, during my time, there were some games. Well, in the huddle. They'll call automatic, right? They say four three automatic or three four automatic. Uh -huh. So what we had to do as def defensive players, we had to know first of all where we were on the football field. Were we in the red area, red zone? Mm -hmm. Or we're in the white zone? There's a white zone and there's a blue zone, right? Wow. A lot of people don't know that. We, they always talk about the red zone. Oh, there's yeah. a red, white, and blue zone on the football field from a defensive perspective, right? And so we had to know where we were. We we're in the fifty yard line. And that automatic on the 50-yard line in a certain formation was a certain defense. Oh, so everybody, everybody on defense had to know the defense. Oh, yeah. And when it changed, when, when, it, when the formation strength went one way or another, things changed. Oh, yeah. So you had to be capable um, academically. Oh, yeah. To do those, that. Right? To do those things. And so, so yeah, so they don't – you, you got to get that. You got to get those books. You gotta it's get those like books. going to another separate in, independent class. Absolutely. There it is. There it is. And you there got to study just like you go to a regular class. Hey, listen, listen. The great players, right? i never forget. I, I, I got to the point where I love studying film and when I was mm -hmm. playing pro ball. It, it's an art to it. And, oh, yeah. and if you do it, it's, it's the one reason why I played 12 years, not because I – I, I was still fast because at the end of my career, I couldn't run a lick. Mm -hmm. But I knew pretty much where they were going before they snapped the ball. You, you knew where you needed to be. I knew where I needed to be. And right. so those are the things that make a true pro. Oh. And so if you're not that dedicated or that passionate about what it is you're doing, you're not going to make it. But but you imagine know? if you could take that youngster, right. that, that young kid going into the league and get them to understand the importance of reviewing that and looking at those film on a regular basis and yeah. studying on a regular basis. Now you combine that athletic ability with that smarts. Right. That's all pro. Right. All world hall of famer. Oh yeah. So, so I took a guy, <clears throat> I took a guy who I love named Deion Sanders, took him under my oh, way. Yeah. We came to Atlanta. I was in my ninth year. I was an old pro when he came mm -hmm. and I knew he went to Florida state from, from Fort Myers. And so it was my responsibility to take care of that guy. Right. Yeah. Um, but I tell you one thing, he, he was the most explosive athlete I had ever seen it witness in my life. Yeah. Personally, he, he, right? he was gifted. He was gifted. He was more than gifted. I, but he had like three or four things on him. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I can say about that young man, I took Dion under my wing and we started studying film together. Mm -hmm. And he loved it as a as a rookie and a second wow. year guy, a third year guy. 
He loved it. And so it will be the old man and the young buck in the room. Uh -huh. We'll be watching film all night long. But you know, you, but you don't hear that about him. They don't speak on that. About they don't him. talk about that. They talk about the prime time. Right? Exactly. But that guy worked just as hard as he was gifted. Yeah. The preparation. He, he put preparation. the work in. He put the work in. He put the and work it's in. unfortunate that they don't speak on that uh, about him right. uh, because that shows you another aspect, another dimension of his overall capabilities. That dude was dedicated to the game. And, and, he, and he loved the game. He yeah. loved the game. He was, he, he, I'll tell you something, man. He one of the most amazing players that I've ever seen, college and NFL. Well, 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 well let, let me say this about him. Being his teammate and playing the league 12 years, there was no – put it this way. The things I've seen him do on a football field that I witnessed, sometimes, Varro, this is no joke, I would shake my head. Did he mm. really do that? Did okay. I just see him do that? I'd be like, is that real? <laughs> you know, but well, I'm gonna tell you what seemed to be one of his biggest strengths that I what I witnessed of him mm -hmm. psychologically, he had no boundaries. He had no boundaries. There you go. There you go. On, on what he believed that he's capable of he doing. Was capable, he was capable of doing. That, that, true, that. true that. True that. And you're dealing with a man that's that prepares and have the physical uh attributes with that type of mindset, you get a Deion Sanders. And and on top of that, one thing else I like to say about him too that a lot of people don't know. He was one of the biggest corners in the league. <laughs> yeah. See, a lot of people now, you know, during my time, they looked, at his, they looked at the ball, they looked at his legs. They looked at his legs. He had the skinniest legs. He and yeah. listen, he would wear five pairs of socks on his legs because he thought yeah. he looked like he had polio, right? <laughs> but when I tell you legit four two, unbelievable. And yeah. he was he was six two. And he had a bot now he had an upper body on him too. Now. He was 6'2. He came yeah. in the league 6'2, 198. Yeah. You see, I never knew Dion was even 6'2. Man, Dion is was a, a big corner for that time. <laughs> he wow. was a big corner. Boy, you'd be good to and be a the fastest corner. That's a good, that's a good, that's a good cornerback for this time, 6'2. Six 6'2. Two. Six two. Let, let me tell you what I seen him do one time. I gotta tell you this, because they're talking about my home, uh, uh, one of our other homeboys. Mm -hmm. So we, we're playing the Vikings in 1989. Right, mm -hmm. so Deion playing right corner. I'm playing the left corner. We're in a cover two, and I'm on AC. Right now, uh -huh. you know, you know, AC can run. Right, a yeah. AC, another gifted guy. Oh yeah, you know, absolutely. Un 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 unlimited gift. Right. Oh yeah. So I'm in cover two on AC, and he goes inside. So I hit him. I take him inside. Tight end came to a flat, so I had to let him go. Come off on the tight end, and Kramer hits AC between me and Jesse Tugger, who's a middle linebacker. Right. And caught it right there in that crease, right? Bam. And he took a sharp right turn and was heading up field. And Scott Case was coming down. You know, Scott Case would want to knock everybody out. Yes. And he he put he gave Scott a little limp like that. Scott went to the ground. He was gone. When I tell you gone, he was out. And I'm looking back. And in the corner of my eye, I see Dion. Now, Dion was on the line of scrimmage on the other side. Cover two. <laughs> he caught that joke before he got to the five yard line. I believe. I'm telling you so, man. People don't. That, that was people one of those times. Varro, that was one of those times. Said that's AC. That's AC. And AC was a AC was a was a flash. Man, AC was a monster, right? Oh <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, he was a monster. I'm telling you. So I've seen I've seen Dion do some incredible things, but you know, it's more than just and just like we're talking about, it's more than just the athletic ability. Oh yeah. You gotta have a mindset. You gotta have that, that, that passion, mental capacity, aptitude, and the passion, the passion is hard to get it done. It's, at least, if you want to last in the league, your athletic ability to take you for the uh, carry you for the first few years, possibly. Few years, but, but if you want to last in the league, you better build that mental capacity yeah, and aptitude capacity. if you want to stay. And absolutely. you're a prime example uh, uh, of that yourself. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Varo, all right, we, we talked about sports. I want to talk about. Um, your journey to being the police chief in Delray Beach. Mm -hmm. um, now, we, we talked before, you never dreamed of being a police officer at, at a young age. Never. Tell me about your evolution to, um, to, to getting there. Well, once I realized that my athletic career was probably uh, uh, at, its, at its end, mm -hmm. I had to start looking for different things to, uh, to satisfy myself. So I, I, I kind of dealt with that dad in a few different professions. I worked with the uh, post office briefly. I worked with UPS. Mm -hmm. Then I went to school 
for education. I said, you know what? Let me get educational shot right. because no, I'll, no regrets. Mm -hmm. So I taught school for four years. I was in Dade County mm -hmm. and heading into that fourth year. I said, man, no, I can't do this for 30 years. <laughs> I just happen to have friends in law enforcement right. and they start persuading me, man, to look into law enforcement. I said, man, I really don't want to be no cop, man. You know, <laughs> not that I had anything against cops. I, just, right. I never had an issue with a cop, right. you know, so I just something that's never really considered. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, you know what? After um, the year is about the end, I said, you know what? Let me look into this. So, mm -hmm. I, so I, I applied for a Metro date. I was teaching in Miami. I okay. applied for Metro Dade, and I was commuting from born to the Miami. Wow. So I applied for Metro Dade first. I came for Metro Day. I applied for West Palm Beach. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to Bornton. Bornton was had an article in the paper saying they was looking for minority applicants at the time. Right. Okay. I went there to get an application, and they wouldn't give me one. What? <laughs> Are you kidding me? They wouldn't give me one. Wow. So, and, uh, and actually, I went to Delray uh, last. I went to Delray last, mm -hmm. and by the time school got ready to uh, to uh, start that following mm -hmm. year, mm -hmm. I heard from Delray. Wow. Delray brought me in, did an interview process. They threw, they took me through the process within three weeks because they wanted to get me into the next academy. Wow, that's amazing. And, but they end up, they got me through the process. They hired me, and the academy was postponed for another three weeks. Okay, but they put me up in dispatch. Mm -hmm. to train so how that benefited me i end up learning all the codes and t the 10 codes and signals before i went to the academy ah okay that gave when you I came out of the academy that's something i didn't have to concern myself with because i already had it right cool but but also you know coming from that athletic background mm -hmm. that transcend that transition over into my current profession absolutely i had to compete Absolutely. I saw it as a competition in my mind right. because when I started in a job, I was 32 years old, Bob. Wow. I was 32 years old. Wow. And with that being said, I knew at 42, I wasn't going to be chasing nobody. Right. <laughs> Understand what I'm saying? I was not. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to be chasing. That was not my goal. So right. I, had to, I had to try to figure out what I needed to do right. to get to that next level. Right. right. <clears throat> so I ended up getting promoted to sergeant. I started in 92. I ended up getting promoted to sergeant in 97. Okay. So I got promoted in four years to sergeant. Wow. Okay. So once I made sergeant, mm -hmm. now granted, once I made sergeant, um, I ended up going to night shift. And bro, I'm going to tell you something. I almost went back to teaching. Wow. That's tough, ain't it? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but when I made sergeant, mm -hmm. after about a two years, I start working mentally, psychologically on what I needed to do to get to lieutenant. There you go. There you go. What training? I had the college situation on the, on the wraps. I mm -hmm. went there with a master's degree. Okay. And I obtained another master's degree once I got there. You got there? Okay. Once I got there. Cool. So, so the education, so what trainings, what law enforcement trainings that I needed to, to elevate me to the next level? Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if they don't promote me, it won't be because I'm not qualified. Right. There you go. That was my there mindset. You there you go. You're preaching good now, bro. <laughs> exactly. So when I when I figured that out, I start doing those things internally. I started implementing programs in the mm -hmm. department that we still use to this very day. In wow. 1997, I implemented a program called Hotspot. OK. Hotspot campaign where people was able to actually fill out a postcard, stick it in the mail to report crime. No post is necessary. Ah, OK. And. And now we have it, not only the postcards, you can also go online and do it too now. Oh, you know wow. what I mean? So I started implementing programs mm -hmm. to help elevate me and the department. The department uh, right. And that allowed me to get promoted to lieutenant. That pushed me to lieutenant. Awesome, man. Awesome. awesome so man. now once I made lieutenant, I had mm -hmm. to look at after about two years, because you got to learn something once you get in a capacity. Oh. You need, you, need, you need to educate yourself. Right. right. When I made lieutenant after two years, I had to say, man, what I need to do to get to the next level. Right. Which was captain. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when I got so I figured that out, did those things that was needed and necessary, and I made captain. Wow. Now we've had uh Lorenzo Brooks was probably was the first black captain we ever had. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he was the highest ranking black that we've ever had. Him and behind him became a guy named Lennox Gillard. 
Okay. Lennox Gillard was the second black uh, captain we've ever had. And I, mm. I was the third black captain, but we never had a, a black to, to surpass captain. Mm. And to show how it worked, never in the history of the agency have they ever had an interview process for assistant chief position. Really? Until, until it was my time. What? <laughs> All right, all right. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> so I had to go through it. I had just graduated from the FBI National Academy in Quantico. Wow. And uh, shortly after that, you know, I um, had to apply for the job just like everybody else did. So right. I applied, went through the interview process, mm -hmm. and I unanimously was selected as the, uh, as an assistant chief. So I became the first black assistant chief in the agency history. Right. Now, I'm an assistant chief for four years now. The chief right. is getting ready to retire. Right. Usually in the, in the past, the chief recommend his predecessor. Okay. But he had been brought a lady from the outside in, a Cuban lady from the outside who had mm -hmm. retired from another agency for 30 years mm -hmm. as an assistant chief. He had okay. first time in the history of the agency who, that we've ever brought anybody from the outside. Wow. Ever. Wow. Uh, outside of... Uh, uh, so he brought her in as an assistant chief. And so the, what ended up happening on a couple of different occasions, she informed me that she wasn't interested in the chief position, that she was going to support me for the chief position. Mm -hmm. So I immediately came, became suspicious at that point. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and to make a long story short, instead of the chief making a, uh, making a recommendation who he believes should be the chief, right. he they decided to put a uh, a competitive competition in place between she and I, and th and that really divided the agency. Right. The morale was at probably right. at as as lowest point uh, that, that that I've ever experienced mm -hmm. in uh, in the agency, and uh, but during that selection process, I end up being appointed uh, chief by the city manager, overwhelmingly awesome. by the city manager, becoming the first black chief in the city of Delray Beach and the agency been around since 1911. Wow, isn't that amazing? And I tell people all the time, it uh, I'm not the first qualified person black to, oh, okay, to come, through this, to come through this agency. Understand right. what I'm saying? Right. Right. You know, through the grace of God and put myself in the right positions in the right places mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. doing the right things right. and for the right reasons mm -hmm. helped me get to this position. And right. also support of the overwhelming support of the community. Right. Amen. Also Amen. played a major role right. in me being sitting mm -hmm. before you today as the chief, not mm -hmm. only the residents, but also the, the overwhelming support that I had in That's all awesome. You know, and 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 that went a long way. So right. it's kind of right. hard not to uh support me in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Uh but I'm grateful. But mm -hmm. I can tell you that was probably the most stressful time that I've ever experienced in my entire right, life because right, right. it drastically impacted my psyche, man. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you something, man. I pray daily, daily, Amen. daily, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Daily just to be strong in this right. process. Right, right, right. Make it, you know, to be strong in this process, you know, and at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here as the right. first black chief in the city of Delray Beach. Amen. And now uh, it's coming from a man who never in a million years would have thought he ever been a cop. cop <laughs> Think about that, right? You know, that's amazing. Now, that's amazing. It's amazing. I'm going to tell in of my career right. as the chief of police, mm -hmm. and and I'm proud of my career so far. I mean, it's I'm an imperfect person, so quite naturally I make mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. And I've made some mistakes, but I've done a lot of good things. For instance, right. you know what we have had to endure over the mm -hmm. last year with the social unrest that right. has taken place in our community. Right. And I'm here to tell you, I was probably, if not one of the, the first black chief, period, mm -hmm. to speak out publicly against what took place with Mr. Uh, Mr. Floyd. Right. Exactly. You know, and, uh -huh. and, and, and and it's one thing I pride myself. I'm not afraid to denounce wrong. Wrong. And there you go. There you go. I'm not afraid to denounce wrong. I don't care where it comes from no. or, or what color or what color it is. Right, exactly. Right is right, wrong is wrong. Right is right, wrong is wrong. There wrong you go. is wrong. There you know you what I'm saying? And at the end of the day, and I tell people, if you don't like people, mm -hmm. this is not the job for you to be in. Right. <laughs> so, so remove yourself because I'm going to tell you, I'm a component of getting rid of, rid of the bad apples. 
There you go. Amen. Amen. There you I'm go. I'm a component of getting rid of the bad apples. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because there's so many good people in this profession, mm -hmm. regardless of color. There's a lot of great men and women that right. performs these day these duties daily. Right. And for a few people to make our jobs as hard as it has been over the last few years, yes, man. that's unacceptable that's to me. Unacceptable. That's it's unacceptable not, to me. Right. And I will always denounce and speak out against right. that type of behavior in our profession. And if you're not doing that as a law enforcement executive, as a law enforcement practitioner, period, you fail in this department. You fail in your department. You fail in this profession. Uh, and the community. You just, and you the community. Out. Absolutely. Exactly. And that's what, look at here. Our duty is, is to serve the community. Absolutely. That's our duty, to protect right. and serve the community. Absolutely. And your police department is only strong as the community in which we serve. That's right. That's right. They That's need right. us. We need them. Absolutely. Absolutely. It can't, it can't build division. It can't build division. Look here. I go to meetings and I tell them, look here, we're going to always agree about certain mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to agree to disagree sometimes. But you're going to understand and right. know where I stand before right. we leave this room. Oh, absolutely. Before absolutely. we leave this room. And I'm going to tell you something. All people want the same thing when it comes to law enforcement is to be mm -hmm. treated fairly. Treated fairly, that's it, right? <laughs> it's just that simple. It's just that it's simple. Treated fairly. It's just that simple. Don't treat me because differently because my skin is a little darker. Right. Don't treat right. me a little different because my my, my my religion might be different. Be different, you know right. I mean? you know right. what I'm Don't treat me because my sexual orientation that's might right. be a little different. Yeah. That's not our duty and, and, and responsibility to judge people. That's right. It's to serve and protect people. That's awesome, man. And then once you lose sight of that, oh, it's, yeah. time to leave. it's time it's to leave. leave. It's time to leave. And, and you it's know, leave. unfortunately, Javar, we got a lot of that going on. And I, I think just in the time that we lived in with the the, the past leadership in office, um, it tended to bring people out of the closet. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. Um, well, it kind of showed the true colors of a, 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 a large percentage of, of this country that they've been hiding for quite some time. Sometimes, and, you know, if you'd have asked me um, 18 years ago, you know, six years ago, um, have we come a long way since the 60s? I would say absolutely. Right. But man, I, I, I think I've been wrong. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna tell you how, how, how I explain that to people. Yes, mm -hmm. we have come a long ways, mm -hmm. but we still have a long ways to go. We have a long, yeah. Out we have there. a long ways to go, and yeah. I tell people, don't get caught so caught up in uh, positions. Right there, you go. There you, you go. know, uh, you know, even my position. I'm a black, right. black right. chief. I get all of that. Don't get so right. caught in that. Mm -hmm. You got to get involved in the processes. Absolutely. You got to get involved in the processes, and go. voting is just one of the parts of that process. Is that means a lot because right. those are the people who's deciding on what type of services that you're going to receive in your community. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm speaking at the local level. Right. I'm speaking at the local level because right. we as people, we neglect voting at the local levels. That's and guess right. what? These people are sitting on the diocese determining what type of services that you're going to receive, what right. type of taxes you're going to receive. And right. guess what? You find out about it after it's already after been put in place. There you go. There you now go. you're arguing, you're upset because these things have put in place. But guess what? Everybody who's making these decisions had to be voted in those positions. Right, exactly. I'm exactly. saying, and I'm exactly. gonna tell you something, Bobby. Right. The best person for the job is not always the best per. It, it always the person that looks like you. That's true. That's true. I'm saying, I'm saying, you got to look at a person's track record and their agendas. That and you got to read them. You got right. to read. Right. One thing my dad always told me: if you ever want to keep a secret, keep it, put it in a book. Right. There you go. We don't read. You got to read. So you so you can understand, you understand right what whom you voting for and what right. you're voting for right right it, it's a, it's amazing it's really just that simple right it's, it's just that simple it but unfortunately simple. we don't do it we we don't do it Delray has seventy thousand residents now on paper Delray seventy thousand seventy thousand on paper now you're wow. talking about one of the hot is downtown areas in the entire oh. southeast part of the United States in, 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 exactly. I'm saying, so you're mm -hmm. looking at 125, 150,000 people a day coming into Delray. Wow. And that increases over the weekend. Right, right. So Delray is not Delray 
of old. Of old, right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. But with that man said, 10, 11,000 on the high end, that mm. votes. Right. Wow. Are you kidding me? That's it. <coughs> it, wow. it, it it's not just Delray. It's most of the cities. Most of the cities. Wow. Most of the cities when it comes to local elections. Wow. That's amazing. So I, I try to tell if you want to, if you want to truly impact, if you want to affect policy, right, and make change, it starts at the voting booth, but, but at a, on a local level. But prior to going to voting booth, understanding what you're voting for, right, there you go, and what that change should look like to you, look like, right. There you know what I'm saying. There so I think we fail in that aspect. We right. fail. We fail. We fail in ourselves. And we right. fail in our communities. Right. When we don't take that a little bit more, take that seriously, seriously. Right, right, right. exactly, exactly. But man, I, I tell you, man, we, we got to revisit this. We go, I'm gonna have you on again. Okay, you gotta, you gotta come on again, so no we can problem. really get really get into some of that stuff because I really want to know um, um, uh, a little bit more about you know your job, you know, okay. and, and, and it's and it's important for us to um, to know and to share that with people. But look, Absolutely. man, our hour is up. But man, listen, man, this has been an awesome, awesome, awesome day, man. I'm, I, man, I'm glad you came on. I'm excited to have you. Thank you for and having me, man. Let's let's do this again, man. Let's do oh, this yeah, again. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, let's keep talking, man, because we I got talk we got to talk more about Alex too, man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we got to talk about him. Hey, listen, man. Um, uh, thank you again. That's our show, ladies and gentlemen. This is 100 yards of football. This is our legend piece, and man, we we had a legend on tonight. Chief of Police, Delray Beach, Mr. Javaro Sims, spent an hour and 10 minutes with us today. God bless you and what you're doing. Uh, we're we're going to continue to pray for you because we know your job is not an easy job. No, right? it's not. <laughs> it's not an easy job. And so uh, and we thank you so much, man, for being with us tonight. God Bobby, bless you. Thank you for having me, man. God bless you and your family. Thank you. And if you like the show, comment, share it with, 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 with friends. This is 100 Yards of Football, our legend segment. And we had the great Javaro Sims with us tonight. God bless you.